Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. And by Ring, stop crime before it happens. Help make your neighborhood safer with Ring. Save up to $150 on a Ring security kit at ring.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Recode Decode. I am your host, Kara Swisher. No, I'm joking. I am not Kara Swisher. I'm just wearing my aviators in a dark, cavernous studio, our new studio here in the Flower District of San Francisco. It's really great. We have our own studio. And we are here at This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. And this is the show where we talk to founders of companies that want to change the world. Once in a while, I'll invest in those companies. The hardest verticals for startups to go after in some rough order are healthcare, music, construction, and real estate. Why are these four categories extremely difficult for founders to build companies in? Well, they're very attractive for one reason, and that reason happens to be the reason of why they're so hard to penetrate. The reason they're attractive is because they're huge. There's lots of money at stake. There's big decisions at stake. If you look at something like education, it is the second most considered purchase in a person's life after their home, which leads us to the home, which leads us to construction and real estate. Those are very hard to break into. You have incumbents, whether it's real estate agents and brokers or big construction companies who fund building buildings and multifamily homes, et cetera. And finally, there's music. And music is not a considered purchase. In fact, it's kind of disposable, right? 10 bucks a month, five bucks a month for these unlimited music services. You can get it all for free on YouTube. So why is music so hard? There are incumbents who own and operate the labels that have a disproportionate amount of power. Therefore, if you are a company and you do well, like Spotify or even Pandora, you're constantly having to negotiate, renegotiate, and um, basically bow down to the people who own that content. Some people say rightfully so. Other people say they have a stranglehold and they hold back innovation. And my guest today is working on one of these four extremely hard categories. And a friend of mine, Paige Craig, who you've seen on the program, introduced me to him. His name is Judd Schoen Holtz. Right on. Welcome to the program, Judd. Thank you for having me. And what I love about Judd already, off, off just right out of the gate, is that Judd has his first name on Twitter, Judd, which is J-U-D-D, is how you spell your name. However, you spell your Twitter handle how? Four J's, four U's, four D's, well, eight D's. So, yeah. I well, because you have two D's in Judd, so it's really eight. Two X, or four X Judd, yeah. Uh, so it's more like... Your Twitter handle is Judd. Yeah. Judd. Wouldn't, wouldn't recommend my tri- Twitter handle off the bat. But you got yourself in the first name club. You could say you have your first I name like on that. Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think it's kind of hilarious. Um, the JJ with the three X J Judd was taken actually. So did did you have an edible okay. before you made this name? Um, no, it's I think legal it was now. my I think it was my AOL like screen name. Oh, was it day. Judd? Yeah. So I think I just, I just rolled with it right into Twitter. <laughs> uh, and uh, anyway, Judd Schoenholtz <laughs> is. The co-founder and CEO of a company called Open Listings, which he started back in 2014. As I said, Paige Craig is an investor, and so is Kim Mai Cutler. Am I pronouncing that correct? Uh, yeah. Correct? Kim, Kim Mai? Yep. She is the person on Twitter, and we've had her on the program, yeah. who talks about real estate, nimbyism, yimbyism constantly. I'd say she's the most knowledgeable person on the, what you'd call housing crisis in California. So definitely, yeah. If you want to follow somebody on Twitter, my Judd times four, no. I yeah. think she's, I think she has her full name at. Yeah. Kai is, a, uh, Kim is amazing to follow and she's a great, uh, she was a great guest. You raised $7.5 million from Matrix Partners, Arena Ventures, uh, and you got a bunch of other people in there and you went to Y Combinator as well. Tell us, how do you plan on solving the real estate crisis in California? You know, you're not trying to solve the real estate crisis. You're trying to solve what crises? What well, problem does open listings solve? Well, we, we solve it in one way just off the bat, which is we just make every home more affordable. So we're a service that helps you buy a home, find and buy any home. You use us instead of a real estate agent to go through the entire transaction process. Okay, do the to in- find and buy a home yes. without a broker. Yes. 
You do the entire thing online using our service. We, at the end, will pair you with an agent in our network. So the last mile is fulfilled and you get handholded through the negotiation and closing process. Hmm. But it makes it more affordable because you get back half the commission that would go to that agent. Got it. So our plan to solve the housing crisis would be to make every home 50% more affordable in terms of the fees that you pay to your agent. Right. And the fees are 6% here in California? 6% divided amongst, well, 5% usually in California, 6% in the rest of the country, and then divided amongst two agents. So Two and a half each? Two and a half each. So well, you save people. Two and a half percent on the purchase of a home. Half of the two and a half. Half of the two and a half. One point two five percent. One point two five percent. Which here in California, with you know two million dollar homes, you're talking about saving sure. twenty five grand. Covers most of your closing costs. A uh, huge amount of money uh, when you need it most, uh, especially when you move into a house. You're about to spend yeah. you know more money than you're ever going to spend. Okay, so now I had heard of a business like this and mm-hmm. actually used them, Redfin. So we might as well tackle that head on. Totally. I bought my current home and the loft we're sitting here in the Flower District in with Redfin. Mm-hmm. I love that product because it saves me some percentage, sure. which I think is similar. How are these ideas different or did you just copy their idea? <laughs> uh, great question. So, I mean, I think um, Redfin obviously has been around for a while. They just IPO'd, big company. Yeah. Um, I would say that the, well, our savings is about three to four X on average. So at 50%, they've been rolling back their buy refund. They talked about this openly. So you're going to save three to four times the amount of money with us than ah. with Redfin. So that's obviously huge. So um, they're not giving as big. You're giving 1.25% back. Yes. They're giving back what? It's Well, they don't exactly say why. We've written about this. Um, uh, you can Google Redfin Refund. You'll find some articles, some research on it. But um, I think they haven't seen a lot of price elasticity as they roll back the refund. So they've rolled mm. it back almost to zero and almost to fund lower fees on the sell side. Mm. We focus 100% on buyers. Um, so we're able to automate more of the process, build a more efficient back end. Uh, the product is way more self-service. So Redfin, at the end of the day, is still pairing you with a Redfin agent. Yeah, I have a Redfin agent. Yes, So exactly. their original idea was to have a central agent, I think. Mm-hmm. But then they realized they're just going to, or I think they just hired a bunch of agents. The agents get paid. Yeah, they employ thousands of agents across thousands the Thousands of agents, yeah. and I have one. Okay. Uh, so pitch me <laughs> on why I should use open listings versus sure. Redfin. What's your best pitch to me, mm-hmm. a whale of a buyer? Well, I, I started with your 4X refund, so I know I know you like money. So I do like, I, who told you? Uh, <laughs> God, it's getting out that I like money. So that, that's going to be good. But I mean, I think at the end of the day, what we see is customers don't want to meet a red, Redfin agent. They don't want to meet an agent. They want to purchase a home. So uh, you guys asked me to run a demo. You can actually go yeah. through the entire purchase process process on our product. So instead of just getting introduced to an agent when you have a question or you want a tour, you can actually do that entire piece online. We'll ah. send somebody to unlock a door for you. Got don't it. have any interaction. So maybe the evolution of what Redfin tried to do as right. they've gone more mass market and now it's more traditional agents meeting you for coffee. You're now talking about your Redfin agent. I don't think our customers talk about using an open listings agent. They talk about using open listings I as hate a product. Agents. This is a, the, they're the bane of my existence. Okay. I, I like my Redfin agent because he knows I hate agents <laughs> and I hate agent behavior mm-hmm. because my belief is that agents do not care about the buyer or the seller. No, they're incentivized to do the deal. Just to get a deal close. Yes, at any cost. At any cost. And this leads to weird behavior, doesn't it? Weird incentives, it? yes. What are the weird incentives that you've seen? What are the horror stories? What is the worst that can happen to unsuspecting buyers and sellers? Well, something that we see commonly on the sell side is, you know, the seller's chosen a listing agent, and so they have somebody representing them, and then they find an unaffiliated buyer, and then instead of it acting in the best interest of their client, they'll try to solicit that unaffiliated buyer by trying to make a deal between them to order to earn twice the commission. So that's ah. obviously, instead of having it be like an open process and having as many bids as possible, they're then, you know, motivated to actually against the best ah. interest of their own client to take this new buyer's bid because they're actually earning 2x. Um, Do they have to tell the seller that? Um, they'd have to disclose that they're yeah. representing both parties, but mm-hmm. you're talking about, you know, piles of forms and a very yeah. busy process. So disclosure is obviously covers you legally, but is not necessarily. Um, yeah, that know. seems like a pretty gnarly one because yeah. it would limit the buyers. And then they did a yeah. research study. I don't know if you read this one, hmm. but they did a research study. And I think Redfin used to cite it all the time, which is, Brokers would mm-hmm. have their houses on the market twice as. Oh no, this was in the book at the beginning of Freakonomics. Yes, Freakonomics. They right. sell their own home for like I don't know the exact percentage. Well, it was but some significant double-digit mm-hmm. percentage. They keep it on the market longer, and they twice send it, as long they yes. keep it on the market, and they sell it for some large percentage totally. more. Mm-hmm. So in Freakonomics, they they brought that up. Uh, maybe I mean, what ring producer Jackie will dump that into my uh, <laughs> chat here, but I'll pull it up later. But that also seems to be mm-hmm. the killer. Um, that seems to be the revenue killer yeah. or the maximizer because I like to be patient and I feel if I'm going to buy a home, I want to get four no's and then a yes. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get five yeses because sure. that means I have 
overbid. Totally. I want to grind people down until I get a deal. Interesting. What if you lose the home, though? I don't care. Okay. I'll, there's always You're another to walk home. away. Exactly. I, and what I do is I always do it opportunistically. Mm -hmm. So I bought this loft when we didn't need one. We had an office space that we work. Mm -hmm. But this a loft, they wanted 2.4, then 2, then I offered them like 1.6. Sure. And then I go on up getting it for 1.8 or something. Cool. It's very nice. It was a pretty great deal. Yeah. But I, when I worked with other brokers, yeah. they were, I found they were negotiating against me. They were telling me, don't sure. put that offer in. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Is, that's a big part of totally. it. Like, do you try to stop people from putting in ridiculous offers? Well, what we try to do is give people guidance at the bottom of the funnel. So we try to find out, you know, what other offers. The, so I, taking a step back, I think it's what's happened is the real estate agent's job has radically changed because of the advent of the internet, not because of us, because of Redfin, hmm. but just because all of the marketplace has gone online and then everything yeah, that- Trulia and Zillow, exactly. they merged. But everything that they used to do, which was f like literally be the access to this phone book of inventory, right. drive you around for nine to 12 months, Ugh. hand hold you through the entire process, get you qualified for a loan. All these things have become democratized, not because of us, but because of the internet. Yeah. So then the agents really only left to do a deal and yet they're still paid the same percentage that they were paid. 10, 15, 100 years ago. Why hasn't that gone down? Um, or has it gone down in some locations? It's really, so it hasn't gone down on the buy side. Really only the, the reason that we refund money is the only way to save the buyer is actually to act on behalf of them as the real estate agent and give back part of the commission. The seller's on the, will on the, Yeah, and so the seller, and the seller's kind of unaware of the refund. So it's just settled through the closing process. Yeah. We receive the money, we give it back to our buyer. Um, on the sell side, we have seen some commissions go down. It's also, yeah. it's a privately negotiated thing that's not, widely reported. So it's kind of unknown exactly what sell side agents are charging on the sell side, especially at the high end where it's going to be guaranteed money, guaranteed income for that agent. So they're willing to compress their sell side commission a little what bit. What should they get if they're selling a $5 million house? Hmm. What do you think is the proper sales commission um, let me, in LA or totally. here? Because right now they're getting two and a half, right? Sure. Um, That's a lot of money. We think the actual cost... $125,000 to sell a home. So let's just say it's a marketplace. Let's ignore agents for a second. The actual cost of doing the transfer and then outside of like the escrow and title company, it's probably like a 0.5 to 1% total fee that you could charge and still run a profitable business as. Got so it. you're saying that's like the true cost of transferring the home between the buyer and seller and offering some modicum of support in the listing and so transfer So $50,000 for a $5 million home should be the cost. Sure. Yeah, but it's not. Well, and the, I mean, that, the other crazy part is why is it a percentage-based fee? I mean, we don't really solve this problem either, but yeah. it's really, I mean, we know empirically it's the same amount of work for a home, you know, $500,000 home as the $5 million, $50 million home. So people should just pay whatever, twenty five grand or something, fifty grand. And The problem is when the home gets listed on the MLS, like 95% of homes do, they right. list it with a cooperating fee structure. So there's a buyer and a seller's agent fee, and you almost have to pay that fee. Yeah. So once it goes on the marketplace and there's this dominant two-sided realtor marketplace, um, the fee structure is built in. There's really nothing to do about it except for use our company and All get right. back half the fee. When we get back from this quick break, I want you to show me the product because yeah. it works on phones. Uh, works on everything. It actually works on mobile phones. It works which on mobile phones. You could buy, uh, you could actually buy a home. I'm going to try to buy a home. I've never done a demo like this. I'm literally going to try to buy a home. Buy a home in San Francisco. Good luck. Um, <laughs> and I want you to um, answer the question uh, when we get back after the demo as well of Ha what is the, has the real estate industry tried to stop you? Because I know that anybody who tries to do anything innovative, the incumbents try to ban them or they get together and block them from seeing inventory and other nasty tricks when we get back on This Week in Startups. Ah, yes, the Walker Corporate Law Group. Scott Walker has been a friend of the show since the beginning, and he is, in fact, the longest-running, continuous partner of This Week in Startups, and the Walker Corporate Law Group is a boutique law firm specializing in supporting startups and their founders, and they encouraged fixed fees. What is a fixed fee? They tell you what it's going to cost to accomplish the tasks that need, you need to get done, whether that's mergers and acquisitions, or starting your company, or licensing agreements, uh, your terms of service, privacy policies. All their lawyers have decades of experience, and they're not junior associates learning the job and the craft of being a great lawyer on the job with your startup. They're not experimenting on your startup with their legal. These are serious lawyers who know what they're doing and they charge a fixed fee because we all know billable hours reward inefficiency. So if you want to talk to the founder himself, Scott Ed Walker, you can call him directly 415-979-9998, 415-979-9998. Or you can email Scott 
scott at walkercorporatelaw.com. Scott at walkercorporatelaw.com. Put Jason in the subject line. Jason sent me. Okay? walkercorporatelaw.com, 415-979-9998. Thanks again, Scott Walker, for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups for, I think, seven or eight years you've been with us. I really appreciate that, Scott. And uh, it's great to have built uh, this little podcast with your support to support entrepreneurs because I know that's what you love to do as an attorney. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Ah, yes. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can follow me. I'm at Jason on Twitter and at Jason on Instagram. And you can do me a favor and write a review of the show and then take a screenshot and send it to me over Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. And then I will retweet and get you more followers. And I will thank you because my mom reads every single one of these reviews. Do not put anything in about me using foul language because my mom does not like that. And she will call me, Jason, I saw the review. Did Somebody, she listen to the show or just read the reviews? My mother listens to the show okay. and she also looks at all the reviews. It's important. And if I drop an F-bomb, she says, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> she writes that. you a four-star review? Yeah, yeah, my mom wrote me a four. I, like, I love this podcast, except for the language, mom. It's a fair point. Uh, my guest today is Judd Schoen Holtz, and he is... Uh, the CEO of Open Listings, which my friend Paige Craig is an investor in, and he is trying to save people money when they're buying a home. And we're in crisis here. We're going to get a little demo of this, but are, are people trying to stop you? Because I remember talking to Glenn in the early days of the Redfin, and I, when I tried to get a Redfin agent in LA, it was impossible 10 years ago. They yep. literally would not show homes to Redfin agents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are they trying to screw you too at <laughs> openlistings.com? Well, I think we... Uh, you know, coming now and with all you know, Redfin and other models, I think, you know, the marketplace is a little more open for mm. alternative models, I they would are. say. Yeah, I'd say like, you know, the discrimination they face is probably, yeah. you know, people are used to now working with Redfin agents. We bought homes from Redfin. So I think yeah. in general, the market's probably more receptive. Um, we follow a pretty, like a different business model in that we use local independent brokers or uh, members of other brokerages, as well as some people who work for our brokerage. So it's likely that we would pair you with not, uh, an open listings agent, but a local agent in San Francisco would help you buy the home. So it solves this discrimination, mm. information asymmetry problem Got because it. they're just a local so agent. So you have agents who will do the last mile for yep. you, but you've negotiated with these pre-approved agents to exactly. accept a ridiculously lower fee because they don't have to go with you on that crazy nine month tour. Um, yeah, the agents that work with us love working with us because they don't have to like, so the least favorite part of their job is finding clients. It's obviously mm -hmm. the hardest part, curating those, what they call leads, um, mm -hmm. making sure they convert for nine months, driving around to showings. Um, we give them clients who are ready to go with an offer on a home. So mm -hmm. all they're doing is negotiating and then handholding the buyer through the closing process. Mm -hmm. And then we have all these services on our side that help make that and software that make that way more efficient and easier for them. Mm -hmm. So they're spending the uh, 10 to 20 hours of really focused time just getting your offer accepted. I mean, I'd say the problem with real estate agents in general is, you know, they're they're not focused on the piece that really matters. Like if you're talking about negotiation, um, you want them sitting there calling the seller 100 times a day until your offer is accepted. As soon as an offer comes in, you want them to be available, not at another showing mm. or trying to solicit their own clients. So our buying agents, the ones who do the last mile piece of it, are 100% focused on that. And so even though they're paid a smaller piece of the commission on like an hourly basis or, you know, in terms of the work that they do turning into revenue for them, uh, it's incredibly valuable. Mm. And you'll let people put in a soul crushing bid. You won't give them a uh, um, like, no, if somebody said like, yeah. I want to offer 40 percent less for this place, would well, you let them? We have. A, yeah, no, totally. We have a lot of guidance on our site. We give them pricing guidance. Um, we will call and say this offer will not be accepted. Mm -hmm. um, so like, well, you know, the their agent that they're assigned has um, ways to guide the user yeah. to let them know that they're. May, that offer may not be uh, valid or you know, have a high yeah. likelihood of acceptance. But yeah, at the end of the day, uh, we are building a self-service product that uh, empowers buyers. And uh, our job is not to uh, replicate the uh, bad behavior of the rest of the real estate industry. It seems like there's so much bad behavior. I look at it and um, in the Bay Area, it seems to me that the agents are in cahoots with each other and that they're talking to each other mm -hmm. about their seller and their buyer because they know each other because sure. they've done multiple transactions. And they say like, yeah, I think my buyer would go for this. And the seller's like, I think I can get them up to this. Sure. And then they've... And then they close the, the deal, but nobody ever knows that that's occurred. Totally. And that's why they don't want written offers. That's why I think they dissuade people from putting written offers in because a written offer has to go to the buyer. Yeah. 
Well, back to the seller. To yeah, the seller. It has to be disclosed. It has then, to be disclosed. And then they can't collude to find the true price. True. Right. Yeah. So no, if you're true. listening to this, mm-hmm. never, ever ask your broker to feel out the other broker. Just put in what you in your heart of hearts think is a price that you want to pay and that you think you would love to pay that price. And then they'll tell you what price they would love for you to pay. And if it's close enough, then you can start the negotiation. Do you agree with my advice to other people? I think I agree with that advice if you're willing to walk away. You seem like a ruthless buyer, ruthless negotiator. I'm a ruthless I'd say, I'd say if, you want to, if you want to get the best yeah, price. Joking. I mean, I think the problem is that the home buying piece is emotional. So we try to figure out what the true price of the home is yeah. and give you that advice. And we use a partner like House Canary to really, yeah. we're probably the most accurate uh, ah. appraisal estimates of, of homes. Do um, they, the, uh, who's this company? They, they House were, Canary? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, they're great. So they um, power most of the appraisal industry. So oh. they give um, price estimates. Estimates um, on demand, mostly for like institutional owners. Mm. Um, but we have a partnership with them, so our buyers can get. Do they go visit reports. the home to get the price, or well, they so just look they at power pictures? the appraisal industry? So they actually ah. get private data from appraisers for homes. So they actually have the Got best it. data set, we believe. Interesting. Um, and so, but the true price of the home, you believe it's worth that. Somebody's maybe willing to pay five, ten, a hundred thousand yeah. dollars more. So it gets away from what the home's worth and more towards what somebody's willing to pay. See, and I think this emotional baggage is what the brokers are counting on totally, to manipulate yes. you. Absolutely. And I love the idea of the internet because it removes the emotion from it. Absolutely. You can just say, here's what I'm willing to pay. And here's the thing. This idea that you're going to insult the seller, I think is farcical. The seller wants to get data on what people want to pay for the home. And they're smart enough to look at it and say, oh, yeah, I got lowballed. That's a lowball offer. I'm not going to counter it, which so, that's happened to me one or two times totally. where I didn't get a counter. That's the negotiation process though. Right. So there wasn't even a counter. So it was like, okay, yeah. fine. No counter. Then well, I got to know I got to raise my price or walk away. Well, we've had that happen and then no counter or, hey, this is too low. And then 14 days later, uh, they come right back. So I mean, I think exactly. that's totally a valid strategy. Actually, the first home. So we started the company, three of us designing the product during the day. I got my real estate license. I did our first 20 deals. The first home that literally happened on, we put in an offer. It was a home in Torrance, SpaceX engineer. Shout out to Jesse. Um, and yeah, we just put an offer that he thought was fair, put it in. They said no. And I think probably like seven days later, they call me back and they're like, okay, we'll take the offer. And this really? During YC, we had like no product. We found him via like an ad word. Uh, yeah. And he closed. So you were home. blown away when that happened. Well, I think it, it was the beginning of kind of understanding the dynamic and also kind of understanding what kind of product you need to build, to solve the mm-hmm. problem. And so, yeah, I mean, those were definitely early days and, um, I barely had my real estate license and I had huh. no training. I have no idea how they let me, uh, transact homes, but yeah, uh, it worked out and he's, he's still there. Okay, let's take a look at this oh, uh, yeah. app here. Load up your phone for okay. a second. I'm going to now. We remember, 98 percent of people are wa- are not watching us. It's good. They're listening. So as we do this demo, you got to do it like a sportscaster okay, cool. and tell people what they're seeing. Okay, so our product is incredibly sick. You um, instead of just searching on a map, we personalize a feed of homes. So if you say you're shopping, huh. where are you where are you shopping? In- uh, I am shopping in the general area of uh, Hillsborough. Okay, so Hillsboro. So I'm not yeah. going to edit my feed because it's pretty tailored to Los yeah. Angeles where we are, but um, we're going to give you every home the moment it comes on the market from the MLS. So here's there's a home here that was listed an hour ago in looks like Pasadena. Beautiful. No, no? you too don't small. like. Too small. What's too small? Oh, too small for you. How many square feet is it? Um, let's see. We got 3,300 square feet. It's Way too big. small. Which is good for the guest house. Okay, well, let's just buy this one just okay. because it's All more right. about the buying. We're just, I'll buy, we're just you know what? This is my uh, little uh, Pasadena crash pad. Perfect. Crash pad, yeah, perfect. yeah. I've never been to Pasadena. Okay, perfect. If I happen to go, I need this place. So I think, I think the problem with all the other services that people use uh-huh. is... If you need to take the next step on anything, you're just referred to an agent. You got yeah, to, call you, on the phone. Exactly. And they sell that lead. And they, sell and they get lead. 10 bucks. Yes. They sell that lead to three different agents. And the agents convert them at like one to 2%. Yeah, it's a, it's a horrible... And That's then, the Zillow business model, exactly, isn't it? Exactly, yes, absolutely. And Trulia, they just... Because I know that when I went and said I want to see the house, there was an agent waiting there for me. That wasn't my agent. And I was yeah. like, who are you? <laughs> are, you the se- are you the seller? And yeah. they're like, no, I'm your agent. I'm like, I never <laughs> made you are my agent. Yeah, they trick you into clicking the button. That's good. what I felt happened. Yeah, I thought no. I was talking to the buyer. Yeah. Well, that's why they convert at such a low percentage because most people are clicked into clicking it. Yeah. So for us, you hit get more info, we'll send you a report. You ask a question, we'll answer it. We have a whole support team there to answer any questions. You're not paired with an agent. Okay. No so here we go. It just has, it looks like a, you know, a, a slick looking real estate app, but. Okay. But now, here. so oh, now you're actually creating power. an offer. Got it. Okay. So you're a baller. You're going to offer hundred K over asking. Looks like a strong offer. And it um, looks here like you're sliding a slider just so we sports catch people. You're yeah. sliding a slider to say, I'm going to go 
100K over. 100K over. And it's giving you a little text underneath that says what? It says that it looks like a strong offer amount because homes in Pasadena, it's not such a hot market. Only sell for 1.2% over asking. And you're about, I don't know, 5 to 7% over asking. Got it. You so also you're giving you, that real-time guidance. Real-time guidance. Now, if I put the slider down at less than we're the We're probably going to discourage you from doing it. What it's do you a, say? It's recently listed. They might not be ready to accept an offer so, low, uh, so ah. far below the price. You can also help me decide an offer price. So this is the idea that maybe mm -hmm. you call, you have, once you get inside to an agent, they're going to ask the seller's agent about other offers and ex expectations. They're going to mm -hmm. collude with them to make sure you pay the highest price. Exactly. But they're going to solicit the information you want to understand if there are other bids or what price you maybe right. would want to pay. And um, here you say, how are you paying all cash or mortgage? So and mortgage, that matters why? Um, well, it matters... Um, because how we fill out the contracts, we need to know yeah. if you're paying cash or mortgage. But also, um, as we present the offer to the seller, uh, we're going to say whether you're paying cash. And obviously, sellers are looking for short terms and yeah. cash buyers, mortgages with at least good terms, high amount of down payment, especially in competitive markets. Right. If, you have, if you're not paying cash in Los Angeles or San Francisco in the Bay Area, you're at a serious disadvantage or a disadvantage? I wouldn't say serious disadvantage. Um, we win offers. Um, I mean, sellers are mostly looking for price. They're also looking for certainty. So I mm -hmm. think if you can create a compelling package, it's multiple things that you're trying to check boxes on. Okay, what are they? Um, so, I mean, one that comes to mind and it comes next is we let you create an offer letter. So uh -huh. do you ever try that tactic? We see that no. users that include a letter to the seller, 2x uh -huh. likely to get an offer accepted. What is an offer letter? What is an offer letter? Yeah. It's a picture of your family, what you're going to do uh -huh. with the home, how much you love it, how great care you're going to take it, how you're not going to tear it down and turn it oh, into really? a mega mansion. Yeah, I mean, I think we give you templates and we guidance around doing it. But uh, we see, and then you attach baller. that to the. Yeah, no. It's How a, many it, people send an offer letter? Well, we such. try to encourage everyone to do it. I don't. I don't think the. What do you think happens in a place like San Francisco or Los Angeles? Oh, you mean how many people? How many offer letters are they? Uh, what receiving? percentage of people will? send an offer letter in the way you're saying, like, yeah. we really love the home, it's our it's family, question. we love this, this, and this. Is it 10% or under? No, I'd say it's I'd say it's uh, somewhere between 10 and 50%. Oh, oh wow. Um, That's pretty interesting. But I think you got to write a great offer letter, and we give you guidance on how to do that, and we ah. give you templates. What are some of the we'll things you that you want to include in there? You want to you pull the heartstrings a bit? It's pulling the heartstrings, exactly. Um, oh, and say, here's our kids. Here's yeah, and say you're going to preserve the home. I mean, I think if a seller, you know, has an emotional attachment in the home, you don't want to ah. be like, I'm going to tear it down and build a new kitchen or something. Really? Usually. They want you to use that old kitchen. <laughs> no. You say but the main thing is tearing the home down because people would like to believe that they love their home and that it should be preserved forever, yeah, even want, when it's garbage. I think, um, you know, again, you're trying to give certainty to close, but you want somebody who's going to take care of this home mm. that you've, you know, spent your life, your kids grew up in. They want you to see your kids. I'm doing everything blind now. Blind LLCs. I don't want them to know who I am. Um, I don't want to get Googled. What do you think of that? I, I think that's a good tactic. I think if they know, you know, how lovely this this loft is and how many of these. And why is this guy nickeling down? Yeah, exactly. Why is yeah. he lowballing me? Why is he um, lowballing me? So let's say you okay, want to. Here we go. Let's say you want to put fifty thousand. Uh, Okay, so you're going to put the $50,000 down. You put Sorry, 50% down. That's 50 why I wasn't letting me do it. Good. Um, you can take our suggested terms or you can customize all your terms. Oh, so wow. if you want to, so I think the other piece, uh, I didn't really fully answer the question. Um, short term, so short inspection or waiving your inspection contingencies, waiving your appraisal, which is the bank, if you're getting a loan, will come appraise the property. Waiving it means that you still get an appraisal, but if it comes in low, you'll make up the difference in cash. Um, mm -hmm. Shortening the length of escrow. Um, anything else you want to include, you can actually preview your closing schedule. So you see what all the dates are going to be over the next month as you close the home. Um, here's me. This isn't my phone number. Um, so you have a little bit of your buyer info. I already have an account. Um, let's say I did visit this property. Um, I don't know. Let's say I visited it last year. Seems unlikely. Oops. Um, okay. So I started, I already assigned to an agent. So Beatrice is my agent, um, here in Los Angeles. Um, so I'm not getting paired with a new agent, so I already have a relationship with her. Um, next step, uploading all my pre-approval letter, pre-proof of funds, so all the financial docs you need to attach. Um, submit to review. Okay, so great. So we're pairing with an agent who will prepare your contract. I created my offer and review. And then next, I'll review and sign my docs. So I think in a few minutes in my email, I'll have a full DocuSign, all the mm. contracts that I need. I wow. click a button for my phone, and then we'll see if it gets submitted. I have to say, this is actually more elegant than Redfin now. Because so. I've used Redfin twice, and... When you get to this phase, yeah. you're just talking to your agent. So totally. I'm just SMSing with totally. my agent saying, here's what I want to do. Yeah. Bing, 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 which is nice. Well, we way. offer that path as well, but most yeah. people know. I, I mean, know. I like this. So, I like setting these things myself and getting educated. Sweet. So totally. getting educated, I think, is the key piece yes. here. 
I think that's one of the lovely things of the of the well, UX. And, the, and it goes very deep as well. So like if you want, oh, what inspection, what is an inspection contingency that we have help docs and articles all about that so you can really make a good decision. The other thing that we see is, you know, our busiest time is actually Sunday night. So you've gone to open houses on Sunday, you found a yeah. home that you fell in love with, and it's Sunday night, you don't have an agent. NAR says 41% of people actually only engage in an agent when they're ready to make an offer. Mm. So this is like pervasive. People are waiting to the last minute. So because they don't want to work with an agent until the end. Right. So Sunday night, you what are you looking on Yelp for reviews? You're hitting like a Zillow pyramid. No, and even if you have it, like somebody who you could use as an agent, they're watching Game of Thrones <laughs> or Walking Dead exactly. or any of these other great Sunday shows. Totally. They don't want to pick up the phone. They're like, call me Monday. <laughs> well, Monday maybe offers are due or maybe That's it. you get ahead of it's everybody. Over. Game over. So you create an offer Sunday night. Uh, we'll pair you with an agent right away and submit it. If you need any guidance, they'll help you right away. We have an entire network of agents. We'll route your offer to somebody who's available and All then right. you'll have it submitted by Monday. When we get back from this final break, I want to know, you know, you got your Series A here uh, done. You've raised seven and a half million dollars. I want to know how you plan on competing against multiple large incumbents that are s- funded at a hundred x your tiny little ragtag team of rebels and your little startup against insurmountable odds. How does a startup like yours, you know, uh, how do you be scrappy enough to beat the incumbents or at least not get crushed by them when we get back on this week in startups? I love and use the Ring doorbell. It is an amazing product. And as you can see from this insane video, it works. And you've seen these videos multiple times on the local news, probably in social networks. They're shared everywhere. And this woman is coming up. She's got her getaway car waiting for her. And she goes to get the package. And what happens? The Ring doorbell owner sees her, gets an alert, and he says, hey, put that package down and she runs for the hills. There is nothing better than having a ring doorbell in your community. And hopefully everybody in your community has these and you will see crime rates drop precipitously. Ring is the best way, the best deterrent against people stealing your boxes and having peace of mind. And it's just wonderful to know and have a record of who is coming in and out of your house, the back door, the front door, the side door. I I literally have two of these and the floodlight. They are amazing products and you will love them. The floodlight's amazing. The floodlight comes on. It's just like all those motion detecting floodlights you've had, except this one has a camera built in. It is amazing. And you know what? Uh, If you are concerned about your setup, because let's say you don't have power at your gate, which I did not have power at my gate. It was going to cost me a lot of money. Let's say hundreds to low thousands of dollars to put an electrical conduit there. You know what happened? Ring has a huge battery pack and a solar uh, plug-in. So you can just throw the solar plug-in in in the grass like I did, and then I don't have to worry about charging my Ring doorbell. So they've thought about everything. Jamie Siminoff is an old friend of mine. He created this company. I missed out on Angel investing in in it, and that has killed me. But, uh, you know, I get the consolation prize of what an amazing product that makes life super easy. My wife loves it. Everybody loves it at the house. Everybody loves it at the office. It's just a great product. And you can save up to $150. Thanks, Jamie, for providing this code uh, on a Ring uh, security kit at ring.com slash twist. That's ring.com. They got that great domain name, slash T-W-I-S-T, ring.com slash twist, and get $150 off when you go to ring.com slash twist twist. It's a great product. You all know that. And it's amazing. You know, when the ring comes in, some people don't understand how it works. You, you could be on vacation, you know, in the mountains, somebody rings your apartment door in the city and you can answer it. You can literally use your voice to say, Oh, just leave the package there. Or, Oh, I'll be right out. So this is what people do when they rob a house. They case the joint. Casing the joint means you knock, put on a FedEx uniform, UPS uniform, whatever it is to try to scam the person. Well, here's, here's your solution. You got them on camera. And now all the thieves know what a ring looks like. They see the camera. You know what they do? They find a better target. So you got to get one. And the easiest way to get one is to get that $150 off at ring.com slash twist. I give it my highest endorsement. I love the product and I use it literally every day. Ring.com slash twist. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest today is Judd Schoenholtz. And uh, you're, you've are you been watching the program for a little while, I understand. I never watched. I didn't know it was video. Listen, you listen. listen. Yeah, listen forever. Forever? Well. You got a couple hell. of favorite episodes? What do you, who, who do you like? You got a top three? Definitely the Sokka episodes. Yeah, that's a, there's a two-parter for the first one. Two-parter. You got some two follow-ups. Yeah, yeah. That's a nice um, collection. And then uh, David Ham- Hanemeyer Hansen, am I saying David that David right? Hanemeyer Hansen, DHH on Twitter from 37 Signals, Base, Base Camp. Camp. Yeah, Love that was fire. Dudes. That was fire. Yeah. Re- rework, still the Bible. 
It's the yeah. second Bible. Yeah. Real Bible number one. Rework yeah. number two. Yeah. I you know I've never Ooh. read Rework. Oh, it's so good. Is it good? Yeah, I gotta read it. I try not to read too many of these things because now oh, that, that one's I'm an easy. Author, it's like one page is a lesson, then you just like oh really? Yeah, it's like a bathroom reading. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it's very um, cool. They have we- quirky, weird yeah. philosophies. There, well, so people yeah. think that we're at odds with each other. When he was on the show, I was playing devil's advocate with sure. him because he's anti raising a bunch of money mm-hmm. and going big. They like to go small and methodical, right? Is that yeah. your take on it? Well, no, I think that's definitely true. I mean, I think what I love about them is it's just a relentless focus on users and products yeah. and sort of not following all this do- business dogma, especially mm. around what you're building. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think it depends. They built a really good SaaS business doing that. I think that's yeah. obviously a great path to follow. But they're not a billion dollar company or a $10 billion company. So they've chosen a different path to be a smaller company well, without no. pouring money into it, without raising too much money. Well, and like we don't use Basecamp, we use Asana. Um, maybe oh, fascinating. If, maybe if they had gone faster, or wider, or something. I'm, Asana not that is those, amazing. Yeah, not that those are totally comparable. I just, but I just got on the Asana train. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. It just tells me what to do every day. <laughs> it's like I was using. I got one, our whole company's on it. Really? Yeah, yeah. Do you pay for it or use the free? We, well, we now we have to pay for it. That's the why. Problem. What I did think, you? What was the moment you hit in Asana that made you pay? Because we're using it. I think to have private boards. Yeah, is that the thing they try to get you on? Is the private boards? But I want. I like to I, run an my, open org. Uh, I, I don't know. I exactly. haven't paid for it. We have now. We're forty people now. So wow. I think at some point we just get everything. How many free. homes did you sell last year? Sold 2017. Five hundred homes since five hundred homes. Yeah. So we're only. How do you make money? How do we make money? We get, we get the one I had. One point two five. It's brilliant. Yeah. Plenty. So five hundred homes. And the average one was a million bucks. Mm, seven in the sevens. So okay, you make so 350 million in transactions. 1%, you made $3.5 million last year. We made more than that. More than that. Mm. How's that? I don't know. We, somewhere the math went wrong. I think oh. our average commission is a little higher than that. Oh, got it. Yeah, we make about 1.25%. I think that was oh, okay. the difference. Yeah. So, oh, right. So you talk about 5 million bucks. Mm-hmm. And you got 40 people. So you're spending about... We got forty uh, people now. Forty people now. Back Growing then, you were like twenty, thirty. Exactly. Exactly. So you were only spending like two hundred, three hundred a month last year. So you were profitable last year, for close for the beginning of the year. Oh, now, okay. I mean, I think the hard part of our business, if yeah. we're being honest, is we acquire customers, but they may not transact for uh, one year, two. What years. What does a customer cost to, for you? Uh, two or three hundred bucks to attract a qualified lead. No, uh, one who transacts or just one who signs up for the product. I mean, the other thing is yeah. we have all these shopping tools. We help you find a home. So oh, we actually sign up people and keep them really engaged. We have a way for you to find oh, homes right. every day. We give you an email of all the newest homes. We let right. you ask so questions. there's two so levels. There's users. We and call then them there's... shoppers and buyers. Yeah, Got exactly. So we so sign shoppers up shoppers cost for... You 20 bucks. Oh, less, yeah. yeah. So Facebook is brilliant for shoppers. People yeah. love signing up, shopping for but homes. you only and then... convert 1% or less. Over the course of two years, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to convert a higher percentage yeah. of that. Um, you can't really accelerate people's home buying timelines. We're just there for no, when they make it. No, there's no way to do that. Um, but I'd say it's it's a good strategy because um, we're able to uh, product market to them for two years. Our service keeps getting better. Yeah. We show how magical the buying experience is going to be by making the shopping experience magical. And so I think for founders out there, you know, even though your core product is probably around buying, having stuff at the top of the funnel to attract users sure. and to keep them around is, yeah. is worked really well for us. Well, that's what this podcast is. This podcast is how I meet founders and then mm-hmm. invest in their companies. <laughs> Although you've listened to it for almost a decade and I, and I never got an email from you saying, well, you want to invest. I or did. No, we've emailed before. We emailed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't yeah. Wait, do you want me to tell you? Wait, I have a, I have a great... Uh, Good. A great, Let's hear it. All right, so... <laughs> this is this is another... Because your so company's is no, worth like $40 million, $50 million right now, so I missed out on owning like 3% of it. So sure. this is a really bitter moment. No, this is this is not related to investing. Though. Okay. Um, evaded, all right, so one of my favorite products, and I'm not... S- I'm not shitting you. Yeah. Is, yeah. Sorry, your mom. Sorry, it's okay. Sorry, <laughs> sorry mom. Um, is, a, is a launch sticker. So oh, super fan yeah. of this product. Yeah. Uh, used, to, love that. used to manage a design team and design agency. Uh-huh. Um, everybody in my team was like in love with it. Uh-huh. Um, I was actually probably forwarding to them for free, which was probably no good That's for okay. you. So I emailed the general line and saying I wanted a like a team subscription or yeah. group subscription or something like that. Um, me, I get an email back, you know, pretty quickly. Hey, that's a great idea. We'll get into it. We'll yeah. look at all the success of my team. One minute later, you email back and you're like, of course, here's the price. Here's the PayPal link. Like, don't put yeah. it here. <laughs> and I was like, that's brilliant. That is hustle. Uh, we're yeah, not going to put this that. on the roadmap. We're actually in like, I and love this wasn't even emailing you. People, like yeah. people email like the info line it works. and I just reply. No, but it worked. You made, yeah. I, I paid right away. It was like my work credit card. It's just a way to like, this is what I think is people, when you build a large organization and you're past 30 right now, which is the moment when I feel founders start to get disconnected from the company. Mm-hmm. Because with 30 people, it's sort of like that Dunbar number. You can only have this many relationships. I think in a company, the Dunbar number is around 30. Totally. Because after that, you can't remember everybody's name. You don't know if they're married <laughs> well, I know or their not. Name, or but you have, can't spend time with them. You don't know if they have kids. You don't know if their parent died, whatever the situation mm-hmm. is. 
And so it becomes harder and harder to know the people. And then if there's a problem, you don't have that fabric, you know, that web, that webbing of the first 20 or 30, where it's like, oh, you know, if Jason or Judd missed uh, your birthday, or they, I, I'm sure if they hear about what happened with your mom, they're going to be there for you. Like, it's like, well, yeah, Jason, I give a, you know, he's in and out or Judd's in and out. Like he's too busy. He doesn't know who I am, totally. you know, and you kind of, you have to really start working hard. Well, this is, that's why, and this is, I think, why I see advice, but like why your first 10 employees are so important because oh, they're yeah. going to hire the next 10 employees. You're not going to hire sure. them. And so those people, especially and how they both hire Build and infuse culture with them. is super important. Um, I do agree with your idea though, of like the products getting better and better and you're building that trust with the customer mm-hmm. because I, that is exactly how I wound up with Redfin and Mm -hmm. I used the product for two or three years and I set up there. The thing I liked about their product was the alert system. Mm -hmm. I think that's something for you to, cause I signed up for your system and the alerts were really good too. So somebody's watching the store with your email alerts Mm -hmm. and I think SMS alerts would be really good. Interesting. Some people I would add SMS alerts Mm -hmm. because we did that to Mm -hmm. inside.com with our email newsletters. Like, and that's really helped. Interesting. Um, So I think that's an interesting product for you to just look at, Mm -hmm. which is, if you could get SMSs of the exact home I'm looking for in real time, that gives me an advantage over everybody else. Because totally. email, I got to get through. But if you, if I said, I'm looking for a four bedroom mm-hmm. or more and a million dollars, not two million, not 500, but it's got to be, you know, 750 to 1.25 and four bedrooms and within 10 miles of this zip code where you're I sh- work. You're showing up right away. It's just, I'm clicking. You yeah. know what the open rate of SMS is? Like very high, hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. When's the last time you didn't open an SMS? You ever uh, get an SMS? And only when it's it? from like Lyft. <laughs> what, what's Lyft? I've never heard of this company. <laughs> oh, yeah. this, what is this company? I don't know what it does. What do they do? This is like a company that does storage or something. I think they just waste. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's terrible. It sounds horrible. Um, all right. When we left our hero Judd, uh, I was asking you, how does one oh. compete in an area with giants? Mm-hmm. You're a, you know little, uh, you know, fox, and yeah. you're running around an elephant stampede. You got Zillow, you got Trulia, you got Realtor.com, you got Redfin. You got a mm-hmm. lot of big players with hundreds to thousands of employees and millions, uh, I'm sorry, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. Mm-hmm. How do you compete coming into that? And then my follow-up question is, how did you convince investors that it was even worth giving you money to run the fox under the elephants, so Mm. to speak. Well, I think you have to carve out your market when you want to compete, right? So like you mentioned Zillow and Trulia, and we talked before about how they just refer you to agents. I mean, I think we don't necessarily compete with those services. If you're a home buyer, you can use any shopping service you want, but what we compete on is being the best and most affordable way to buy. Mm. And so that's just not within their vernacular. That's not how they market Zillow. Zillow is connect with a great agent near you. We are buy a home and save money and Mm. do it in the most efficient and enjoyable way possible. Mm. So I think it's just owning that buying process, even though our product kind of competes against them and really trying to focus most of our attention on that piece, ha- making sure that the agent connection there is really great and natural, that people in our network are working really well, that we can submit things fast, that our cost of service is as low as possible. So like, I mean, the discount is a way to track customers, but it's also, we operate our business at an incredibly efficient, low mm. cost of service. So we can It forces operate, you to be efficient. Forces it us forces to be efficient. forces you to think about yeah. how repeatable and this process is. Exactly. When you're making 2.5% as a buyer, mm-hmm. you could be doing faxes and bundles and totally. having messengers or your assistant drop something off. <laughs> and and do just a nonsense. few transactions a year and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Exactly. There's no drive to be efficient, which means there's no competition. So mm-hmm. what I'm hearing here is you are focused on making it repeatable and efficient, whereas those other people have no incentive to. Yeah, and so and they don't market in the same way as we do, and they they also don't really attract the same customers. If you want to find an agent, that's great. If you want a smiling Redfin agent, that's great. But if yeah. you want to do it yourself and buy a home on yeah. your own and do it in the most efficient, best way is possible, it's generational. You use us. Do you think? Absolutely. So where is the split? Because I'm Gen X. Yeah, I'm 47 now. You're a millennial. You what are you? 25, 30. <sighs> 36. You're 36? I know the makeup. Look at you, baby. The makeup well, Okay, looks, so you're yeah. gen, you're kind of Gen X on the bubble of... Yeah. You were born 1980? 81. 81. So you, you're you like a... Uh, I think I'm yeah, on the bubble. You're I'm Gen a- X. <laughs> I'll put you in Gen X only because I think you probably like Nirvana. Um, yeah, I'm very formative. Nirvana or Cardi B? Pick now. <laughs> One or the other. I'm Three, go. two, go. I'm going to go with Nirvana, but I do, know, I do know what Cardi B is. So. You do? Yeah, I Somebody guess I'm asked me, like, 
you don't know. And they're like, what? I see Tremoth was like, you know why she's called Cardi B? I was like, come on, Tremoth. It's because Bacardi was going to sue her and she was scared of getting sued. And she was, she was like, oh, you do know That's that. That's good. I didn't know that. Yeah. She was like on some show. And she's like, Brr, I, I thought I was going to get sued. And so then I just changed it to Cardi because I thought Bacardi with the B, but the C, it's just Cardi, Cardi B. I was like, okay, Cardi B, very good. You, she knows trademark law. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. She's brilliant. I think she's hilarious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if I had to be on a desert island with Kurt Cobain or her, I'd go Kurt Cobain, full Kurt Cobain. Uh, I don't know. She seems more entertaining maybe in the long, in the long run. It's about how long are you going to be on the island for? Well, I'm not saying with them, but with their album. With oh, their musical with their album. catalog. Oh, oh, yeah, oh. Yeah, pretty easy choice. Oh, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> do you think it's Gen Xers who want to embrace this, or are they still stuck in the old model? Because clearly millennials want to use their smartphone. Sure. They don't want to talk to a human ever. Well, look they at all the have other... like Asperger's, even if they don't. <laughs> You mean ADD, not Asperger's? Yes, both. All of this stuff put together. Whatever they <laughs> well, look could at get their the, hands on for pills, they did. Look at all the other services that are uh, catching on amongst that generation. You're Lyft. using well, Wellfront to manage Uber. your money. I know. I use Kayak Wellfront. to build to um, book your to book your what are you? Kayak, Wellfront, <laughs> um, Coinbase, toy, uh, TurboTax. Yeah. Um, so you see all these yeah. self service, low cost products. It's not no that, humans. It's, it's no yeah. Dealing with humans I was just going to say, yeah. Like talking to someone, making small talk. People go out of their way to not work with an agent. They maybe pay us more to not have to talk to an agent. I think I, we that's actually tested, correct. We, we haven't tested that, but... You could literally say, for $1,000, we will guarantee you that no yeah. agent will ever talk to you. You well, can so, only talk over SMS. So we have a service where um, you can book a tour on our website and um, or through the app. And so... Uh, the feature, not a bug, is that the agent who shows up unlocks the door and doesn't hassle you at all. Yeah. So they let you enjoy and tour the home as you want, and they're mm. not there to sell you on themselves or the home or any way. So yeah. sometimes people are confused. They're like, that person didn't know any of the home. We're like, yeah. that's a feature, not a bug. Yeah. They're there. They're doing showings all day. It's incredibly efficient. If you want to order a tour, they'll unlock the door for you that afternoon. Yeah. But that the, they're not going to be your agent. That's and that's what actually I like brilliant. about, you know, Keith Raboy's company? Mm -hmm. What's his company? Open Door. Open Door. He's just buying the homes. They're buying the homes. What do you think of that idea? And then they're just like, you can go see it 24 hours a day with cameras mm -hmm. in it. And there's a mm -hmm. door and you unlock it and just go there at one in the morning if you want to see what the noise level is like. Yeah, no, I, I, it's pretty um, slick. I think it's brilliant. And yeah, I think the advantage of being on the sell side and the way they do it is that they control the selling process. So they can do things like allowing anybody to tour it and having it go right. direct or... Can they not charge a fee like... Well, unfortunately... I understand, and you know, per their website, they have to charge a pretty high fee because they're buying it direct, they're uh -huh. holding it for a minute, they're renovating it, and then they're reselling mm -hmm. it, and they're even paying a broker's agent at the end. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we're not in the same markets right now, but we could actually, our buyers could buy an open door home and actually save money. Yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think it's a really interesting model. I mean, we're a fan of anybody trying to change this like two yeah. broker system, and so um, they're definitely taking a big swing at it. All right, now answer this question for me because you made the app that makes it appealing to millennials. But how do you get the millennials to stop ordering Phil's coffee and avocado toast so they can afford the home? Well, the refund helps it become more affordable. <laughs> um, Does it include avocado toast at closing? Well, you know, did you see that like SoFi had, they got a bunch of press because I think they were, if you get a SoFi mortgage, they were going to give you like avocado toast. I don't know if they actually- A crate of avocados? Yeah, yeah but it got, it, it got on like CNBC. It was kind of whatever that's PR pretty person delicious. says. Yeah, pretty that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty clever marketing. Now, what about the trend that I hear that millennials don't want to own stuff. Oh, totally. Is that true or not? Um, well, and I don't know about stuff. In, sure, I don't know about stuff in general. I mean, right. I think there's interesting subscription model businesses like Joy Mode in LA. You can like subscribe to like a, an event or like if you don't want to buy like a game system or a VR system or a drone, like they'll mm -hmm. rent it to you for the weekend. I think for that stuff, it totally matters. Um, we see millennials definitely wanting to buy homes. I think a lot of studies have shown that they do. I mean, I think the problem is because of homes being so unaffordable and then people being saddled with student debt, mm. um, it's becoming less common for them to be able to do it, like in terms of where they are and their age range compared to previous generations. But um, we, yeah, we work with a lot of millennials. They definitely want to buy homes. They want to pay rent. They want to live in, I mean, I, um, I don't know. They, they maybe don't want to stay in a hotel. They want to stay in somebody else's home. But when yeah. they come home, I think they'd like to build a Yeah, a see, home. I think that like this not owning a car makes mm -hmm. total sense totally. to me if they live in a city. Mm -hmm. If you can afford a car, why not, right? Well, it's, it's more convenient to take Uber 
in for San sure. Francisco. Uh, Uber specifically. <laughs> Uber specifically. Um, well, I mean, one minute versus you don't have twelve to, minute wait times. And you don't have to park, and you just yeah. hop, you know you don't have to think about it. Um, versus owning a home versus well, I don't I don't know the advantage the convenience of renting. You could move, no. but I don't think I don't think there's really an advantage there. No, um, and it certainly costs much more in the long yeah. term. What about these like dorm? You can live in a dorm. Do you see there's yeah. um, the Star City that launched, and obviously no. like we live. No, um, you're not going to live in a dorm. No, <laughs> I think that that's, I mean, I do think micro units is mm-hmm. a huge idea. Yes. I love the concept of micro units. And if micro units were available, I had an idea for doing a micro unit club mm-hmm. where not for kids necessarily, but for people who have a nomadic or business traveling lifestyle that you could buy a share of a 200 square foot like hotel room. Mm-hmm. And then you had all these clubs. I'll just start with, I had an idea. Is that coming up on it? Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. Uh, so I had this crazy idea, which was uh, almost like a club, like the Battery or Soho House, except you just buy, you buy in for, let's say, a quarter million dollars, and you get a room that you can use a hundred nights a year or a thousand nights, something incredible, right? Or some number of nights per year. And they have locations in... Uh, you know, every major city. Pick tw- the top 20 cities in the world. And you just have micro apartments. And when you have your stuff, and all the apartments are exactly the same specification, so you know what they're exactly going to look like. And then your stuff, you can either leave there in a locker or they'll hold it for you or they'll ship it to the next location for you. So let's say I had to go on a business trip and I got to do LA, Austin, Miami, New York, London, and then I'm going to come home, which some people do those kind of trips. You could nomadically lifestyle, hit all of those. And as you hit them, you could just have your bag sent to the next one or, you know, you know what to expect in each one. It's not like you're checking in. You just come to the front desk. Boom, you're in. I like and that. no like early checkout, late checkout. You just get your room for whatever number of hours you need it. And you get charged by the hour of usage. So you just break the whole hotel model. If I need, if I get there at 10 a.m. and I leave yeah. at 8 p.m., I have the hotel during the day. Mm-hmm. Not this weird cutoff of check in at four and check out by noon. It's kind of random. It's random and well, horrible. It's what about you're going to wake up and not know where you are? <laughs> That's a good part. Yeah. You want it to maybe look a little different. No, depending on where you, are. you want it to be well, like we'll, Starbucks. We'll power that buying model for exactly. you. If you want the buy buttons to be exactly. on the micro hotel concept, we'll, uh, we'll, we're all in. And you're based in LA? We're based in Los Angeles. Yeah. How's it running a startup there now? It's, it we seems love, to be getting a little hotter. We love running a startup in Los Angeles. I have to say, so three years ago, we were in San Francisco. We went through YC. The unanimous advice we got was not to move our business to Los huh. Angeles. It was very... Not, not controversial, but ill-advised at the time. Yeah, well, um, there's just so much more funding here is probably why. More and funding, talent. talent, but more competition for talent. Mm, um, sure. Higher cost of living, higher wages that you have to pay for, for sure. especially like engineering talent. Um, I think for our business specifically, we didn't want to over-optimize on this hyper-competitive San Francisco market. Los Angeles, for many businesses like ours, and I think other businesses yeah. that are starting there, you can find a much more diverse uh, market in Los yeah. Angeles. We see stuff that is like SF, like crazy Santa Monica. Yeah. Um, but we also have places like we serve San Bernardino in Orange County, yeah. which is just like the rest of the country. So I think for us, and then it's more normal. It's more representative more normal. of the country. Totally. And we're, we're so we're in Los Feliz. Uh, Silic- oh, wow. Silicon Feliz. The only business there. Nobody calls it that. You're literally one of one. But Los Feliz. One of one. It's, it's hipster. It's well, it's where everybody lives. So LA has its own problems, obviously, sure. with, with uh, geography and commutes and traffic. But, um, you know, you see the city more migrating to the east. So yeah. downtown and Los Feliz. Downtown where we are, is dope. Totally. And so we're like 10 minutes from downtown. People live like east, Great north, restaurants. downtown. So um, we love it there. We've been able to attract people from all over the country. Egg slut sandwich. You ever egg get slut, that? Of course. Oh, yeah. that's tight. They don't have that here yet. No, they got fills here. in LA. We can just go. Oh, they have fills in LA they got now. Fills in yeah, LA. I did see that in Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. But so you're in a cheap rent area. Super cheap rent. Five hundred dollars a square foot to buy a home. Um, Six hundred. Yeah. No, I think um, four to eight in commutable areas yeah. uh, near our office. Uh, rents aren't as crazy. I mean, I think there's just more places to live and easier to yeah. commute. Um, hard to find large office space as we've been growing. We're in a storefront now. We might move into a preschool next. So there's definitely not a lot of commercial space. Yeah. But you got to um, look into those child labor laws. I don't know if it's advisable. Well, it, it's not going to be a preschool. It's just I think it's oh, preschool oh, is I like a cool you're setup. You kick the kids out. They already got kicked out. It's oh, like so you're going to kick vacant. the kids out. I'm jinxing it because we have this RFP <laughs> and I haven't heard back yet. So no, that's what it's, happened here in Palo Alto. Actually, people don't know this, totally. but people were would have their offices. So like PayPal and then Elon's company X were both. Next door, to, Max Levchin told the story on this podcast here at the same table. Um, they were next door to each other on university, and then Facebook was there, and Facebook had a couple of different spaces, 
And then the city passed an ordinance in Palo Alto. You can't buy up the storefronts. Storefronts got to be for a store. So mm-hmm. you got to get your store approved by the mm-hmm. city council or whatever. But then Palantir just bought every building. Because mm-hmm. they're like, well, we have unlimited money. Just buy everything okay. in sight because we're getting paid so much money by the CIA, NSA, FBI, or whatever. No comment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, don't <laughs> worry. They, they've already hacked both of our phones. Uh, <laughs> I wish you continued luck with open listings. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, and let me know when you're racing the next round. Okay. Um, if that's now, let's just talk immediately after this podcast. Blink twice. Yeah. <laughs> um, everybody knows This Week in Startups is to educate and support founders and to increase my deal flow in unicorns. Um, <laughs> Let me thank uh, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie. Thanks, Judd, for coming up. Thank you, Paige Craig, for letting me know that Judd is doing a great. I always ask my investor friends, hey. Totally. Shout out to Paige. He's amazing. Paige if you could is ever amazing. Paige him... is going to be our first speaker at Launch Festival Sydney. What's he going to talk about? Whatever the heck you he might wants. Wanna, you might want to vet his speech a little bit. <laughs> yeah, he's always good. And oh, amazing. you know what's going to be great is this is what I decided to do. Yeah. A great entrepreneur can come from fill in the blank. Anywhere. Correct. And so I was like, you know what? We've done a launch festival here for 10 years. Let's take it international. Mm -hmm. We'll go to Sydney. And so we got a bunch of different RFPs, you know, uh, proposals from different countries and uh, different cities. So we went with Sydney. Um, And I'm like, you know what? I want to dive the Great Barrier Reef before I die and before it dies, Mm -hmm. which I think it's going to die before me, which I don't think I could have, I would have said 10 years ago. It's pretty sad. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to just rent a boat. It's going to be super baller like a private boat, mm-hmm. take everybody out for two days, three days diving on the Great Barrier Reef, which is going to be like four or five dives a day, whatever the limit is. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably four or five. Before you get the bends or like what? Well, you, there's a recommended, <laughs> okay, um, it yeah. depends on depth. And so, okay, so I'm yeah. not going to take people on deep sea. Sure. I don't want that on my watch. But, but Paige will. <laughs> Paige is his own animal. Oh, and yeah. Maybe Paige and I will do a, a, a longer dive because totally. we're both certified and whatever. But people will snorkel. So anybody who comes speaks at the event is going to get to come on the private Great Barrier Reef two-day tour. So blink twice if I'm invited. You're not invited <laughs> unless I'm an investor, and then you're totally invited. But uh, that's my public call for anybody who wants to be a speaker. Go to launchfestivalsydney.com and check out the agenda, launchfestivalsydney.com slash agenda. We got a agenda up there. You can go to launchfestival.com slash tickets uh, to get your free tickets. I think it's launchfestivalsydney.com slash tickets, actually. And uh, we're giving away the first 100 tickets, 1,000 tickets to founders for free. So if you're a founder, fill out that uh, form and get a free ticket. Well, there are, half of them are gone already. So, uh, And then sign up for the demo pit. We give free demo pit tables to startups. And then we're having three startup competitions. Frontier Tech, which is stuff like uh, nuclear energy, you know, cryptocurrency, uh, not cryptocurrency. Uh, Frontier Tech would be like really hard science, crazy stuff, robotics, uh, AI, virtual reality. Those would be like Frontier Tech tech that isn't exactly in the mainstream yet is a way to say it. Then we're going to have a cryptocurrency competition. As you know, I've said cryptocurrency, real technology, really promising, a lot of fraudsters. So we're going to try to sort all that out and have five great cryptocurrency companies or token type companies uh, present really interesting products. Same thing with Frontier. And then we'll have the year one competition, startups that have been in market for under a year. The winner uh, we'll pick a winner from those three different categories. We'll pick a winner for each of those categories, and then we'll pick an overall winner for the first Launch Festival Sydney, and that winner will get to come to the Launch Incubator and spend 12 weeks with me here in San Francisco, and we'll invest $100,000 in your startup, just like YC or other incubators do. Thank you to our friends at the NSW Government and Department of Industry. That's New South Wales, for you people who are wondering. Uh, and Business Events Sydney, thank you so much to the Department of Industry and Business Events Sydney and the New South Wales government for supporting LaunchFestivalSydney.com. We could not do it without you. And we're very aligned, um, the city uh, of Sydney and myself and my team, of supporting founders and inspiring innovation. And I'm really excited to get back to Sydney. It's been a decade since I've been there. It's June 19th and 20th. And on the 21st, we're going to do this uh, safari thing, startup safari, which a lot of different people have been doing at their conferences, which is on uh, the Thursday. So Tuesday, Wednesday is the event. And on the Thursday, we're going to let people who have tickets go visit all different startups and see content and meet the startups in their natural habitat. That's why they call it a safari. You go out and you see the, you get it? You yeah, got it's it, Chad? I, it's was worried, I was worried some people were going to shoot animals, but no, we're not going to shoot any better. animals. And uh, just as a programming note, when I made fun of people with Asperger's and Judd made fun of people with ADHD, <laughs> Judd is suffering from both of these tragic uh, afflictions. And so he's allowed to make fun of people with them. 
and himself. He can be self-deprecating about it. No, I'm joking. Uh, I'm, I don't mean to make light of people addicted to their screens, but I just deleted Twitter and Facebook off my phone. You did. The last time I did that, mm-hmm. I wrote a book and <laughs> cool. sold tens of thousands of copies. Yeah. And it was like hugely successful for me and All our team. All you had to do was delete Twitter. Wow. If you delete Twitter and Facebook from your phone, so in about 19 days, you'll hours. have a book. So if you want to be a best-selling author, just delete those two products. That's all device. Are you addicted to these? Um, I am not on Facebook. Well, I guess I'm on Facebook, but I don't have it. You're not like, participating. I don't participate. Yeah. yeah smart move. Uh, Twitter, business, retweet. Yeah. I like Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I like launch ticker. Launch more, ticker more is efficient. efficient. That's efficient. what you need is that efficiency. You're I'm getting too addicted to this Mueller investigation. Oh, yeah. That's tough. It's, it's, it's hard. The addicting. news is tough. Yeah. I get OCD about it. I think I'm getting, I think I have Mueller inflicted. OCD. Yeah. But where, are you reading that on Twitter or other, other places? Well, Twitter's where, this is the problem with the, with the Twitter. Yeah. The, the Twitter <laughs> is particularly challenging because you can type Mueller in at any point in time. Mm. And now there are like five or six people who've made a living out of talking about the investigation totally. all day long. Mm-hmm. So these people are like quasi-journalists. They're kind of like crowdsourced journalists. Armchair journalists. They're armchair journalists. And all they do is try to like put these threads together and mm-hmm. they're like thread and they do like a 50 thread and I'm, I'm all in. Yeah. Because I also like Homeland <laughs> and Three Days of the Condor. We don't want Homeland to be like your country's real life though. Well, the whole, I mean, it's obviously this is the deep state is uh, yeah. trying to get Trump. As you, we talked about, you and I both voted for Trump and we both think the I deep state cutting, is trying to... I hope we're just cutting this entire part out. No, <laughs> we're joking. We did not vote for Trump. <laughs> or we, maybe we did. Who knows? It's we private. don't want to alienate it's any private. potential customers. Palantir it's, knows. Palantir knows who we voted <laughs> for. And now Los Angeles has Peter Thiel. So uh, that's you guys true. That was are, a real win, yeah. It's a big win for you big because win. he's going to do your Series B. <laughs> Wait, let me ask you this question as a founder. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Trump, uh, Peter supported Trump. Mm-hmm. Peter has uh, got very unique, weird, uh, some people would say weird, some people would say unique, you sure. know, whatever, views of the world. He also funded covertly, for a period of time covertly, to kill Gawker, sure, which yeah. is kind of... It's a little messed up. A little messed up, but Gawker was a little messed up, so it's kind of just ugly on both accounts. But yeah. my I point is... Gar- I used to live in New York. We read, read Gawker and Launch Ticker. Exactly. But <laughs> Gawker did some bad things. They, were, they got their hand in the cookie jar like, for sure. with some bad things. But yeah. putting that they aside... Did, they did Gawker Stalker. They'd sell t- where celebrities were on I know. It's really dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jimmy Kimmel barbecued the woman doing it. I don't know if you ever saw that. No, he, I don't he, know. It's a really good interview where she's like making light of it and he's like well i have kids and this other people have totally. kids and we have stalkers and you're calling it stalker which is encouraging people to stalk us and people jump through windows and these actors yeah. and actresses have been murdered by stalkers totally and you're encouraging the behavior of stalking yeah, yeah um putting all that aside would you how would you look at taking money from somebody like peter Thiel? yeah it's a good question i mean i think who you take money from is really important on every level i mean i think you have to evaluate not just political beliefs but sure. just spending time with somebody and knowing that they're going to be involved for 10 years so yeah I don't think, so I think it's hard to write off anything based on like the, you know, the public perception. You'd want to get to know him. You'd want to, you'd want to ask some questions, but yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I wonder if he's on the top of everybody's list. Probably not as much. Um, yeah. That's the interesting thing. I don't know if yeah. founders would, I suspect founders would look at his track record, mm-hmm. Palantir, Facebook, PayPal. And I would think that that would be, I have to consider it mm-hmm. because he's done such amazing investments previously. So he knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And he's obviously helpful, and he's on the board of Facebook still. Mm. So it's a fa- it's a helpful person having your team. And I don't know what his political beliefs would have to do with. This is one of the problems with America is we care about people's political beliefs. Well, and do you think it would affect your ability to attract customers? Like his involvement oh. with it would that be? Hmm. Um, I know uh, I don't know if I should say this, but yeah. uh, company undisclosed. It has um, some Kushner money. Oh, involved. I know about this. Yeah, yeah. They, Jared well, they, Kushner's brother. Yeah, yeah. He runs yeah. Thrive yeah. Capital, and yeah. um, they don't disclose that they're an investor in their company, um, just in case there's any negative perception of that relationship. So yeah. The Kushners have a lot of negative perception sure, sure. about them. And yeah, yeah. So I, I wonder if you'd have the same problem with um, with Founders Fund. Yeah, Founders Fund, no. Just him specifically. But Peter specifically, yeah. I would think some people would have to think it through. I think you'd have to... Well, you have to think it through anyway, so it's good. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. All right, listen. Continue success to open <laughs> listings. Thank and you. Judd, you can follow Judd. He's J-J-J-J. <laughs> U, 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 U. Follow Kim May Cutler. D, 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 D. D, 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 D. That's Judd times four. Each letter four times. <laughs> that Twitter handle again. 
Follow, oh, oh, follow open. No, my team does a great job. Follow open underscore listings. Open underscore listings. Much Twitter. easier. Much and better. It's openlistings.com. Uh, Go give it a shot. The, it's worth it if you're a startup just to see how beautiful it is. And I believe that you are the future of this kind of stuff, just like Wealthfront is because I'm an investor in Wealthfront. And making these things simple, easy, and not having to talk to people on the phone and saving money totally. is what it's all about. Empowering buyers everywhere. Empowering buyers everywhere. That's openlistings.com. Go check it out. Thanks, Judd. You did a great job. Cool, all thanks. right. We'll see you in Sydney. Bye-bye. Bye bye.